Good morning. It's good to be back for another Sunday School lesson with you today. I hope you're having a wonderful fall. It is so beautiful, been so beautiful as, as we're taping this. It might be raining by the time we get to the weekend, but it is good to be with you today. The theme for this month in our international lesson, it's, it's identity. It is remember who you are. It's reminding us that our religion, our faith, it's not just an add-on. It's not just something else that's a part of our life, but it is, it is part of our very identity. It's part of our very soul. It's part of who we are. It's our origin. It's our identity. It is, it is our essence. And so we cannot separate ourselves from our faith. We cannot separate ourselves from our religious heritage. And knowing God and knowing our relationship with God is fundamental to understanding who we are, understanding our identity. And the concept, remember who you are, is important because even if we've yet to fully understand or embrace our relationship with God, this is not something new. This story has been going on for some time. So there are stories from the past, stories from our, our cultural memories, if not our individual memories, that we need to draw upon to understand who we are in this day and this time. But the story does go back a long way. So today we're going back early into the Old Testament, back to the book of Joshua, 24th chapter of Joshua. It's an important point in the whole Old Testament story. When we left the story last week, it's about 40 years before this. And Moses and the people are affirming their covenant. They're affirming the law as the key part of that covenant. And now we've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And we're finally about to enter the promised land. Moses has passed away, and Joshua is now the leader of these people. And we've had some of these wars which they claim the promised land, but now it's time for everyone to go and settle their space. Remember, we've had 12 tribes working together as kind of one unit, but they really are 12 tribes, 12 families. And each tribe is going to have their own territory within the promised land. And so before they all go back to their own little space, their own little communities within the promised land, Joshua is pulling them together to remind them of some things. And so this is where the story picks up, 24th chapter. Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. Uh, Shechem is an important town in the hill country. He summoned the elders, the leaders, the judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. But these were still mostly tribal leaders. Even though they were Israel, they were one nation, they were still very much individual tribes with their own individual leaders. But he calls the leaders of all these groups together. And the situation seems to be that over their time in the wilderness and over their time in Egypt, the Israelites had picked up some other gods. Now, it wasn't just that they rejected Yahweh, but they kind of picked up some gods from the Egyptians, some gods from some of the people they had lived among, even some gods from some of the people they had conquered. So Joshua uses this time to remind them who they are. Joshua said to all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago your ancestors, including Terah the father of Abraham and Nahor, they lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshipped other gods. But I, this is God speaking through Joshua, as Joshua is a, as a prophet here, I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau, and I, sound, I assigned the hill country of Seir to Esau. But Jacob and his family went down to Egypt. That's combining a lot of history very quickly, but the point is God has been at work throughout all of this process. You used to be in another land worshiping another people. I have brought you to this land. And then you went down to Egypt. But I, Yahweh, brought Abraham and gave him this land. This family, you, you there's kind of an interesting contrast between I and you in these next couple of paragraphs. You, Jacob, took the family down to Egypt. A lot of details being left out here. Then I, once again, God speaking, I sent Moses and Aaron, and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did there, and I brought you out. When I brought your people out of Egypt, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued them with chariots and horsemen as far as the Red Sea. But they cried to the Lord for help, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea over them and covered them. You saw with your own eyes what I did to the Egyptians. 
And then you, once again, the emphasis on you, lived in the wilderness for a long time, kind of like it's your fault that you were stuck out in the wilderness. I did all these things. And some of y'all saw it. It's been a while, but there's still people alive who remember Egypt, who remember the Red Sea. Once again, God speaking. I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived east of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them from before you, and you took possession of their land. When they, the 40 years was over, they came up kind of on the east side of the Jordan River, and they conquered those lands first before they crossed the Jordan into what we more properly think of as the Holy Land. But as you, you'll know, some of the tribes would end up settling there on the east side of the Jordan. Just a little kind of side story stuck in here. When Balak, son of Zippor, the king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent for Balaam, the son of Beor, to put a curse on you. But I would not listen to Balaam. So he blessed you again and again, and I delivered you out of his hand. A curse in those days was a very real thing. It was an invocation to God to do something. But God says, these other nations tried to curse you. I refused to listen, and therefore you were blessed because because of what I did. Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, Hivites, and Jebusites. But I gave them into your hands. These people fought against you. I gave them into your hands. I sent the hornet away ahead of you, which drove them out before you, and also the two Amorite kings. You did not do it, with your own sword and bow. Yes, you were there and you were fighting, but if I had not been fighting with you, if I had not sent powers in front of you, if I had not been supporting you, this never would have happened. You did not win these battles by yourself. So I gave you, once again, God saying to them, remember, he's reciting history. I have done all these things. I gave you a land on which you did not toil and cities you did not build. And you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. And that is true. There, there are cities there that uh, they didn't build, but they're now building houses that someone else built. There are fields that were prepared by someone else, but now they control those fields. They are eating the fruit of the trees that have been planted long time before. There's a constant contrast in these verses between what I, what Yahweh did, and what you what you, Israel, did or didn't do. It's almost like it's a bunch of whereases in a, uh, in a resolution. Where is this and where is that? Therefore. Well, now we're getting to the therefore. Therefore. It's not in there, but it's implied. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness, which means throw away the gods, little g-gods, your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Little g-gods are idols. They are physical representations of other gods, other spirits. Some of them are from their ancient past. When they say from beyond the Euphrates, those are gods that were part of your heritage from a long time ago. Or from your more recent journeys from Egypt, and they'll mention some others here in just a minute. They had not rejected Yahweh, uh, but they had picked up other gods, other spirits, other metaphysical entities along the way. What they had rejected pretty much was monotheism, the idea that there is only one true God. And uh, you have to remember, in those days, monotheism was pretty uncommon. Most people had lots of gods and goddesses and big gods and demigods and all sorts of gods. So this was still a unique thing in those days, a rare thing among peoples. And they had slipped back into these old polytheistic habits of, okay, yes, we, of course we worship Yahweh, but we also worship this and that and the other. But the thing is, the central tenet of the Jewish faith is that there is one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. So Joshua challenges them. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, 
whether the gods of your ancestors who lived beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites, these are more recent ones, in whose land you are now living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Very famous verse. It's a verse we have on a plaque in our house. But the key idea is you cannot do both. As I said before, monotheism is the exception, not the standard view. But you, the Jewish people, you are the exception. You are the exceptional people. You are different from everyone else. Well, the people said, of course. You know, the people answered, far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord God himself who brought us and our parents out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Well, of course they say, of course uh, we will serve the Lord. But Joshua comes back to them. Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. Basically, you're saying, are you sure? This is harder than you think. And it does have consequences. It's a time for choosing. And the people say, no, we will serve the Lord. And then Joshua said, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the war, Lord. Yes, we are witnesses. In that day and time, before a lot of writing, before contracts, before photographic or DNA evidence, being a witness to something was very, very important. That's why the, uh, the, the commandment says, thou shalt not bear false witness. Being the witness to a transaction, being the witness to a legal matter is a very deep moral commitment. And so he is just reminding them in, in, in the deepest possible t terms, all right, People have witnessed you saying this. This is not some random thing you have said. No, this has been witnessed. And they said, yes, we will serve as witnesses against ourselves if we break what we just said. Well, then Joshua says, well, don't just say it, then do it. Now then, Joshua said, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord God and obey him. I'm going to talk more about the idol specifically in just a minute. But on that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people. And there at Shechem, he reaffirmed for them the decrees and the laws. You know, kind of go back over the Ten Commandments. Go back over the important things that bind them together. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. That's a, one of those books that we, we do not have anymore. And then he took a large stone and set up there under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to God. Now, this is a very primitive sort of thing, but this is a primitive time. But they did believe that, that a stone could be not just a marker, but somewhat almost a recorder. Now, I think deep down they knew this wasn't true, but it in their minds, it stood as a reminder and a recorder of the things that were said in that place. And then Joshua dismissed, dismissed the people, each to their own inheritance, each to their own part of the promised land. Once again, the important part of the story is the people never saw themselves as rejecting God. You know, even the incident of the golden calf, which had happened some time before, it wasn't rejecting God, but it was, it was trying to make something to symbolize God, something to stand in for God. God was so far away and so unseen and unknowable. They wanted, they wanted something they could touch and see and point to and say, yeah, there is our God. They thought probably else. Everyone else has more than one God. Everyone else has idols. Once again, physical representations of their gods that they could carry with them and, and kind of Put on a shelf and just, just know that they are there. And once again, to be a reminder about their God. 
But these two ideas uh, stand against the basic Jewish law. The Jewish law says no other God. The Jewish law, the Ten Commandments says no graven image, no handmade image to represent God. That's what made ancient and modern Judaism unique. And those, that part of the covenant, that part of the Ten Commandments is still passed down to us. It's still part of our lineage of faith. It's part of our identity. We only have one God, and we, we don't worship anything as a substitute, as an image, as a projection. We worship God and God alone. Today, the problem really isn't rejection of God either, although there are some that, that, that reject. But like them, sometimes we do add-ons. We add on other gods. Now, I'm not thinking of adding on Zeus or adding on Baal, but sometimes people do that. There, there are New Age religions that will take a little bit of this religion and a little bit of that religion. There are people who allow nature and pantheism to become their religion, and they make the creation itself God and not part of the creation. And there are people who, who love Christianity but also want to embrace certain Eastern, certain indigenous practices. That does happen in this day and time. But more often, we make idols or find things other than God in addition to God to worship. We can do it with good things, with religious things. There are people who make their church into an idol. There are people who make the Bible into an idol, worshiping the Bible even seemingly more than God. There, there are certainly people, I, I haven't known anybody, I've heard there are people who make their preacher into an idol and they seem to, to worship the preacher. Other, it happens. Sometimes people worship power. They worship money. They may not use that word, but all of their actions, all of their, their lives say that what they truly honor, what they truly serve, what they truly worship is power, money, fame, possessions. They're people who worship themselves, who worship sometimes their humanity, but sometimes just their own egoistic self. And then there are people who worship sports, Sports heroes, they worship politicians, they worship celebrities. Once again, we don't do it meaning to replace God. But sometimes God seems distant even to us. And so we decide that we're going to worship, or we're going to honor, we're going to serve a substitute, a replacement, something less than God. And so maybe the key lesson of the story from Joshua for us today is to remember who we are, that we have one God, and we accept no substitutes, as the saying goes. We do have other stuff in our lives, and some of that stuff is of some importance, but there's a difference between God and all that God is to us, and God who is to be worshipped, and everything else the universe and everything else in it. Jesus said, you know, no one can serve two masters. Bob Dylan said when he was going through his Christian phase, you know, you might, it might be the devil or it might be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, we serve, we worship something. This story is passed down to us over all these years to tell us part of our history but also to remind us who God is and what God has done and what God demands. And then as Joshua says to the people, then you've got to decide. You've got to choose who you will serve. People say very easy, yes, of course we serve God. But the danger is, is when we think we're serving God, but we're also choosing to serve maybe this, maybe that maybe something else that is less than God. We don't think we've rejected God, but to fail to see that God is the one and only, to fail to see that, that any image, any representation, anything, any substitute or anything less than God is just not God, that sometimes is our failure. Let's stop and pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, 
We do thank you for all that you've done for us. And we thank you that you are our God and we are your people. Forgive us when we doubt. Forgive us when we worship the wrong things. Forgive us when we raise earthly things up to too high a place in our lives. Help us to serve you. Help us to follow your son. But help us to know you, to worship you, and serve you so that we will know who we are and we will know what this life is about. We pray in Jesus Christ's most holy, precious name. Amen. It's been good to be back with you again. Hope to see you again in a few weeks, but take care and God bless you.